here. But, but. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the theory lunch. Um, today is our last theory lunch of the semester, so thank you for coming all semester. Uh, we won't have regular theory lunch during the summer, but there will be talks that will be announced on the theory announcement. Uh, today we have David Weitz here. He's a second year student working with Bernard Kuffler, and he's interested in algorithmic aspects of uh, the theoretical, theoretical computer science. And his talk is about faster distributed radio uh, broadcast Thank you. Thanks, Nika. Um, all right, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, joint work with uh, Bernard Heupler, titled The Faster Distributive, uh, Distributed uh, Radio Broadcast Primitive. And uh, without further ado, let's uh, see what exactly we're going to talk about during this talk. All right. Um, so the, the high-level uh, overview of the talk is exactly like any, ever, any talk you've ever seen before. We're going to discuss the model first. We're going to talk about prior work. And then we're going to talk about our results, uh, going through our general approach, uh, the subroutines we used, and then we'll actually uh, talk about our output. All right, so without further ado, let's talk about the model. Um, all right, so in the radio network uh, broadcast model, we have a bunch of radio towers that are connected in some topology, which corresponds to which tower can uh, transmit to which other tower. And at any given round, towers can either listen so all the towers right now are listening and doing nothing particularly interesting. Or they can broadcast to all of their neighbors. So, I don't know. Can you see this? I guess not. Uh, so imagine this guy's broadcasting. Um, all right. Uh, a listening tower receives a message if exactly one neighbor transmit to it, transmits to it. So again, imagine that this guy has got some special animation showing that it's transmitting. Uh, in this case, uh, what are the towers that actually get a message? <coughs> Only this guy's transmitting. All right, so let me just show this. So these guys get a message because exactly one guy's transmitting to them, and this guy gets nothing because no one's transmitting. If, on the other hand, imagine that these two guys are transmitting. <laughs> right. um, again, this guy hears nothing because no one's transmitting to it, but this guy also hears nothing because two guys are transmitting to it, and not exactly one. Right? Just imagine two people are talking to you at the same time, even if they're saying the same thing, it will probably not be quite synchronized, and you're like, I don't... Silence. Right. Um, and our general goal will be to transmit the message through this network. All right. um, great, so let's, uh, let's talk... The, I think the model should already be pretty clear, but I'm going to be a little bit uh, more precise. So what we have is an undirected graph on n nodes, where a node corresponds to a tower. It's exactly the same topology from a minute, a minute ago. And the rules of the game are as follows. First of all, we have synchronous rounds. So at time step one, I can decide to listen or to transmit. Um, a node, I'm oh, sorry, the message sizes are going to be order of log n bits. Remember, we have n nodes. Uh, this, this will just uh, make sure that we don't do something weird like transmitting, I don't know, way too much information. I'll get to that. Uh, so the message sizes are called reasonably si reasonable sized. And uh, listening nodes receive the message if exactly one of their neighbors transmits to them. All right. Um, we have no collision detection. So what do I mean by that? In our previous example, uh, we had two guys transmitting and one guy heard nothing because two guys were transmitting to it. You hear absolutely nothing. You don't hear noise. You cannot differentiate between, you cannot distinguish between uh, two guys or seven guys uh, transmitting to you and just background noise. So Mary's pulling a, a little bit of a face. It's true that that model seems a little weird, but it's somewhat, somehow the strongest model. So we, we'd like to make no, no assumptions about um, collision detection. Good. And uh, finally, we don't know the topology ahead of time. And this kind of relates ba uh, back to the uh, message size uh, issue. We don't want to have a message where we can just somehow find out the whole topology and just transmit that and do something accordingly. Are we clear on the rules of the game? Yes, go ahead. Everyone have a unique identifier, or does it matter? Or? Everyone, so, yeah, everyone has a unique, uh, unique identifier. Um, so, so, so yeah. who are we in the sense of what, what do we have access to? Uh, we, we're the algorithm designers, right? That's the... No, what I mean. Yeah. Are we, no, oh, no, we're not one particular node. We're trying to build a protocol for all the nodes to somehow be able to transmit a message. Yeah. So it must be an identical protocol for each node. Uh, it need not be an identical protocol for each node, but it will be. Okay. But it could be allowed that if I have three neighbors, I'll run this algorithm. 
it could be exactly if I have three neighbors do something, if I have two neighbors do something else. I don't know the topology ahead of time though, so it's not quite clear. I, I know that. Everybody has a, a, a message. Yeah. After you run the whole protocol, everybody should have everybody, everybody else's message. Pretty much. So I'll, I'll get to the exact problem we're getting to in the next slide. But are we clear on the, the general? Can we be adaptive? Uh, we can be adaptive, and, uh, and we, will, we will be in some sense. Any other questions? All right, so what's the problem we're actually trying to solve? So again, we have uh, a radio network, so this undirected graph G, and we have some subset of the nodes S, uh, which are informed of a message M. All right, so in this case, it will be these uh, two green nodes over here. All right, so that's the input. What would we want to do? Uh, we'd like to transmit this message M to all the D-hop neighborhood of S. All right, so the D-hop neighborhood is just you know, all the guys at distance D or less, D hops or less. So the zero hop neighborhood is just S. That's, that's a relatively easy problem. Right? Uh, start with that message. Great job. Right? Um, the one hop neighborhood is a little more interesting. We want to transmit this to all the neighbors. The two hop neighborhood is to transmit to all the neighbors of the neighbors, etc. Are we clear on the problem? All right. um, so I won't, I won't discuss too much uh, how this is applied for, uh, for other problems, but uh, we mentioned that we're we're trying to get a faster uh, radio broadcast primitive. This is a primitive that's been used for a bunch of other uh, problems in, uh, in the radio broadcast model. Uh, again, I won't, I won't discuss it too much, but just think of this as being like a fundamental building block for this, for this model. All right, good. Um, all right, so we know what the, the model is, we know what the problem is. Let's, uh, let's start with a toy problem just to kind of get a feeling, you know, get, a, get our feet wet. All right, so suppose every neighbor of S <coughs> has anything between k and 2k neighbors in S, some theta of k neighbors. All right. Then in that case, I claim that there's a very, very simple algorithm that solves one hub with constant probability. I'm going to maybe give you like 20 seconds to think about this. If someone, someone here is going to think about this in like 20 seconds. I want to make sure that v gets the message with some constant probability. And it has anything between k and 2k neighbors. One sends with one over k. Yep, send with what probability? One over k. Every guy in S just transmits with probability one over k. Now, why, why is that useful? Well, for every round and every node v that neighbors uh, some guys in S, the probability that v gets the message is at least um, constant. I'm actually, even given the bound, but it doesn't really matter, right? Just think of this as being constant. Um, all right, and are we, are we clear on this? I mean, okay, for this, just remember this. Right? Uh, succeeds with some constant probability. Uh, good. So why is this useful? Well, you know, we can just repeat this log n times, right? Just do amplification. And then uh, with high probability, v will receive the message. Right? It has constant pro at most a constant probability of failing. It can just keep on failing log more than log n times. That's just, that just doesn't happen. Right? Uh, great. So that was our warm-up problem. Um, it was simple enough that, uh, you know, Venkat could think about this for 20 seconds and come up with the solution. Um, which is maybe not a good indicator of how easy a problem is, but anyway. Um, what if we have no guarantees about the number of neighbors? Just guess probability. I can guess the probability, okay. And how would you guess it? Well, first start with the one half, then do a quarter, then do one eighth. Awesome, all right, so Boris has already got the next thing. Uh, so what we can do is just try all the ranges, right? So if you're informed of the message uh, after round number zero mod log n, for the next round, try and, uh, try and uh, broadcast with probability one half, then try and pro broadcast with probability one quarter, then one eighth, up to one n, one over n. And why does this work? Well, exactly because of what we said a second ago, right? So in every, in every log n rounds, you've got a constant probability of successfully receiving the message. Repeat this log squared n rounds, and you're good to go. So there's a notion of time, like everybody has like a clock? Yeah, this, this is what I said earlier, right? The, the synchronous rounds. So they all know, okay, right now it's uh, round zero mod log n. Good, now I'm going to try and broadcast for log n rounds in this thing. All right. Um, good, so with, probability, with high probability in log squared n rounds, we can transmit the message to all the neighbors of S. All right, so we solve one hop. This algorithm called decay solves one hop in log squared n uh, rounds with high probability. And well, that, what does that tell you about the d hop problem? D, log, yeah, D times that, right? I mean, you, you're just shifting, shifting the target. S is originally, uh, originally S, and then take up all of its neighbors, 
that got the message, and then we take up their neighbors, and so on and so on. Great. Um, so d log square then is uh, kind of the, the range of what we're talking about, and actually we can be a bit more precise. So Bar Yehuda, Goldreich, and Vitai, who uh, devised this algorithm in 87, showed that actually uh, this uh, algorithm terminates in order of d log n plus log square then rounds with high probability. And we've actually seen everything we need to show this, but I won't, I won't get into it. It's just like uh, at the high level, just turn off, uh, turn off those all the heavy lift. Uh, great. Uh, so this has been a building block, as I said, for uh, well, for a while now, uh, almost 30 years. Yes. Can you just also in, this, in parallel the nodes which you know don't have messages, don't how many neighbors they have, so that. Uh, so how do they get this message? No, so the so question was, how, how, can you not tell? Yeah. There's still a number of neighbors because the problem is for the those nodes to guess how many neighbors you have. Sure. Um, So the, the, the thing is that the number of neighbors you have is not quite the right measure, right? The, the, what you're interested in is the number of neighbors you have in the guys that are currently informed, which is also a bit of a shifting target, right? Yeah. But you, like, you know, initially when you wake up, do you know the number of neighbors, or do you just, you're sitting there? I know nothing. I'm just sitting there and just, okay. you know, right. spewing out information, and hopefully something, oh, something. Oh, I don't even know that. Okay. Yes, yeah. Oh, but you know if you have the message. Sorry? You know if you have I know if I have the message. That's the, yeah. Otherwise, that'll be a bit too much. Excuse me? Everything is just missing function. I'm not sure I heard the, I'm not sure if I heard the question. Yeah. Only the guys in the set S initially transmit. And we'll, so we'll get we'll get to that in a, in a actually in a second. But uh, yeah, at the very first at the very beginning you could think of only the guys in S talking. <coughs> Alright, good. So as I said, this this has been used uh, in a bunch of algorithms for, for a while now and uh, almost uh, quite a while uh, later. Um, uh, <coughs> and uh, Kuten and then Kowalski and Pelz uh, independently proved that actually some variants of decay do slightly, <coughs> ever so slightly better. So it gives you d log n over d plus log squared n uh, rounds uh, to succeed. So if d is roughly n, you've shaved off that log fact. Right? Um, okay, so so far we've talked about uh, upper bounds, uh, but this is a very a very clean model where you could hope to also get lower bounds, so let's talk about lower bounds for a moment. So if you want to solve the D-hop problem in the radio broadcast network, uh, what's a trivial lower bound before we even start thinking about anything intelligent? D. D, right? I actually want to transmit this message to people D, D hops away. I can only push the message one hop at the, per round, so D is the obvious, the obvious trivial uh, lower bound. A bound of uh, Alon, Barnoy, Lineal, and Pellet shows that actually uh, you need <coughs> log squared n rounds. Regardless of uh, pretty much anything, this, this holds even for d, which is, uh, I think, 3. So like even d constant. Uh, and this is uh, existentially necessary. So in the sense that this, this holds even for offline uh, schedules. Even if I tell you the topology, I tell you everything ahead of time, it's going to take you log squared n rounds to actually push this <coughs> message uh, 3 hops away. Okay. Um, right. Uh, several years later, uh, we should, whoa! Spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, several years later, uh, Kushirevitz and uh, Mansur showed that uh, d log n over d is also a lower bound for this problem. And uh, nicely enough, these lower bounds are uh, composable, so you can show that uh, you need d log n over d plus log squared n rounds to solve this problem. Right, uh, and the corollary of that is that uh, the bound that we saw on the previous page is actually tight. Right, you cannot do better. You see, I yes? found on the previous page a better analysis of the original algorithm, or there's some. There's this some small like, tweaks. Okay. Yeah, but let's let's not go into that. Um, good. So the bound of the previous uh, the previous uh, slide is tight. Um, so this turns out to be like a 15 minute talk, and so. Oh, See you after the summer. No, okay. Um, so here are our results. Uh, this this will be weird. The next couple of slides. I already just told you that this is the best you can do. Something must be feel a bit fishy. So uh, we get a, a better bound, which might be uh, well. It's it's better in running time. It's uh, it's worse as far as readability is concerned. Uh, so this bound is uh, d log n over d times log log n plus poly log. Uh, this is a little hard to parse. So let me try and put this in perspective. Uh, if d is uh, polynomial, this is uh, d log log n plus poly log n. Whereas uh, this bound would still give you d log n. 
Right? And in general, this, is, this essentially beats all the, the previous bounds so long as D is sublinear-ish and at least some uh, polylog uh, poly term. Um, all right, so I already told you you should be a bit suspicious about this, so let's, uh, let's act like I didn't say it and someone say, hey, what's going on? Charlie? What's going on? All right, thank you. Um, well, effectively, we have to look back at the lower bound of uh, Kushilevitz and Mansour and notice that uh, it doesn't quite apply to our problem. In a sense, it applies to a harder problem, what we call the wake-up problem. Uh, and this relates to what Johan asked earlier. Um, nodes cannot transmit, transmit before they receive the message. So this is, let's say this is all of S, this one guy that knows the message. Before a message gets to other nodes, they're fast asleep. Okay. Um, so in a sense, what we're trying to solve here is a different problem. It's like setting up the radio network. This is the first time we're actually using the radio network, and all these guys are just you know, saving power or something and doing nothing except just listening. Okay. So the nodes are already awake, so what we're going to try and do is uh, use this. And, well, not, maybe not use quite the idea that Boris was suggesting <coughs> earlier, but try and, <coughs> try and prepare ahead of time for the message's uh, eventual arrival. Okay. So this is very vague, so let me try and give you a slightly uh, better idea of what the algorithm is. Um, so this is the algorithm from uh, 10,000 feet. We start off by partitioning the graph into connected low diameter clusters. Uh, hopefully in parallel and faster than what uh, this animation looked like. And uh, then in every cluster we do some pre-processing, computing some efficient schedules for when the message finally arrives at this cluster. Right. You said that the bound applies to offline version, but you know the polyge ahead of time. Sure, but that's the, the log square then. The, the additive polylog uh, term is true um. even for offline. We're, we're just trying to, I mean, we are improving on the, the multiplicative term ahead of the D. Um, any other question? All right, good. And uh, now that we've computed these efficient schedules within the clusters, we transmit the message. So we use the schedule to to schedules to transmit within the clusters, within the parts. And uh, every, say, log n rounds, we run log n rounds of decay just to be able to cross across these, uh, you know, across the partition. So is the high level idea clear? All right, good. Um, all right, so there's a few key subroutines we're going to have to rely on, which, one of which I've already mentioned. Uh, so for algorithm, we need the K. Remember I said we're actually going to be using the K to cross between the clusters. Uh, we're going to need some fast schedules, which will hopefully help us cross these clusters relatively fast. And we're going to need the low diameter decomposition of the graph, some kind of clustering. Uh, good, so we've already discussed uh, the K, so let's talk about uh, Yeah. Question. Is graph planar? The graph is not planar. This example is planar, but that's, okay. yeah. Um, we're, we're, in general, you could, you could uh, assume all kinds of things about the, the network uh, topology, and we're, we're just trying to solve the most general thing because a lot of these assumptions don't always help. Um, all right, good. All right, so what's the fast schedules we're going to use? So uh, recent work of uh, Gafari, Heupler, and uh, Chabazian shows the following. If you have a, a radio network of diameter big D and N nodes, in big D polylog N rounds, you can compute a schedule which allows us to do the following thing. It allows us to transmit to and from some prescribed node R uh, to all nodes at distance L in time effectively linear in the distance to this node. Okay, plus, plus this uh, polylog term, which will not prove uh, too important. All right. Um, and secondly, the schedule is periodic, in the sense that you can think of it as kind of restarting every order of log n steps. This will prove useful in a minute, so let me just remind you of the partition. Um, so this part effectively will, will relate to, you know, somehow crossing this quickly. That kind of makes sense, right? Like that's why we're using these, uh, these schedules. This part <coughs> will prove important for the following reason. We said we're using the fast schedules to cross these clusters. And then what do we use to cross this? Decay, right? And we know that decay will be able to cross this in log squared n rounds, which is super fast and is great. But, um, you know, we get here, and the schedule to transmit the message within here could be in any stage. We have no idea what's going on. But since it effectively restarts every log n rounds, we can just get here, sit around idly doing nothing for log n steps, and just kind of ride the wave for the next step. Okay. 
I'm, I'm not going to go over this again, just kind of assume that things work out in that. In that. Uh, any questions so far? All right. Um, one thing we might wonder is, well, okay, this seems to be really fast, right? This is linear in what we might want to, uh, to use. Uh, maybe, maybe we could just cluster everything and just solve, solve that, right? Like maybe we could just use this to solve our problem. So does this solve our problem? Yeah. yeah. What's happening with the D polylog n uh, so this is the pre-processing of this thing, and that's, so that's, that's exactly the issue. Right? That exactly is what we're killing. Sorry? That's why it's not a contradiction. That is why it's not a contradiction, and uh, I don't know it's a contradiction, right? Like, uh, it, it just doesn't kill our approach. Sorry? Did we have an L log n over L as a lower bound? L log n. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sorry. That's, that's why it's not a contradiction to the lower bound of uh, Kushida and Mansu, but uh, uh, the polylog n term here is also the reason why this doesn't solve our problem. Right? If we take uh, d to just be the diameter of, of our graph, um, I mean, that's, that's going to be more than, than the d in the d hop we want to solve. And we want to be d log n, so d poly log n is, is, is an over. All right. Um, too bad, but we can still use this as a subroutine in our, uh, in our algorithm. I mean, we weren't, we weren't claiming to use this and nothing else. So what we're going to do is we'll use these schedules in small diameter clusters. You know, we'll be thinking of D, big D be, as being, you know, little d over poly log n, in which case the poly log n will die out and we're just doing this pre-processing in order little d time. Any question about this? Any question about anything else? Um, all right, so this is what we'd like to use, but uh, first we should have to sidestep a few, a few small problems, the most important of which is the following. Uh, the pre-processing of the algorithm of Gaffari et al. needs collision detection. Right? And we said originally that we, we don't assume that we have collision detection. If I have two guys uh, speaking to me simultaneously, as far as I'm concerned, nothing happened. I, I heard nothing. Um, all right, so how can we sidestep this? Well, we can just simulate the pre-processing step of Gaffari et al. with each broadcast step of this algorithm simulated by a polylog number of decay rounds. Oh, are we at least clear on what I mean by this before I actually try and convince you that this, this works? A few nods in the background. Good. All right. Uh, good. So I have, I have a, an algorithm of... Uh, thanks, uh, I have an algorithm of... Uh, the algorithm of Gaffari et al, which tells me, okay, do something, then do something else. I'm very, very good, right? I'm telling you absolutely nothing right now. Um, but what I'm going to do is instead of just run this one round where I try and broadcast, as in the algorithm of Gaffari et al, I'm going to do... If I have a message in the Gaffari et al algorithm and I'm supposed to broadcast it, I'm going to try and broadcast it with probability one half, then with probability one quarter, then one eighth, up to one n, and I'm going to do this log squared n times, right, for a total of log cubed n uh, rounds. All clear? <coughs> right, thank you. Uh, great. So why, why does this allow us to detect collisions? So recall that log squared n rounds of decay, or log n less than what I've just told you right now, uh, means that we get a message with high probability. If anyone's broadcasting to us, we're going to get it. We're going to get at least one of these messages. Good. But we're going to do this log n times, and every one of the neighbors that has a message and is trying to broadcast has the same probability of succeeding in transmitting the message. Right? So Nick's already uh, nodding, and I'm hoping everyone will be nodding now, but uh, good. Um, so what's the probability of you getting this message log n times from the same guy over and over again? It's polynomially small. So if multiple mo uh, neighbors broadcast in the algorithm of uh, Gaffari et al, you're going to receive the message at least two t uh, from at least two distinct neighbors with high probability. So, so you append to, to message you append some random string to identify the sender or something? Uh, not even a random string. So this, is, this relates to Kirk's uh, initial question. Do you have an identifier? Yes. I send a message and I say, oh, by the way, my name is Bob. Or like, you know, node 15 or whatever. Okay. Um, good. So, you know, at a, a poly, poly log blow up, we can still uh, do the pre processing of uh, Gaffari et al., which is just fine as far as we're concerned, because that still uh, comes, out, uh, comes out to uh, the diameter of the subgraph we're interested in times poly log n times, so it's all good. Any question? All right, great. Um, okay, so we've discussed the K, we've discussed the fast schedules. And uh, now we actually have to talk about some, some form of partitioning that will give us low diameter clusters that will hopefully actually <coughs> help us use everything we've, uh, we've built so far. 
Good. Uh, so a recent uh, algorithm of uh, Miller, Pong, and Xu um, shows the following. For every beta between 0 and 1, there's a random algorithm which uh, outputs a partition of the node set of a graph G, which uh, satisfy the following properties. So first of all, every part is connected and has diameter order of log n over beta with high probability. Right, so if this is the partition we get from, this, from their algorithm, every one of these uh, clusters has relatively small diameter. Okay, which, will, which will somehow relate to our fast schedules, right? We want to run uh, in something that will be diameter times times poly log n, so hopefully the diameter should be relatively small. Right, so that's one useful property. And the second useful property is that every node is on the border of, a, of the partition with probability order of beta. Right, so it neighbors another uh, cluster other than itself with probability order of beta. So we'd hope that guys like this and that and this are relatively small, unlike this example, which is positively littered with them. <laughs> right? um, good. So those are the properties we're assuming about this uh, about this input. Uh, sorry, about this uh, about this algorithm. And all right, rather than treat it as a black box, I'm, I'd like to spend maybe a minute just to discuss this algorithm because it's, it's very, very sleek and I, I mean, I think you guys should know about it, it's really. Um, so this algorithm works as follows. For each node, uh, you sample some exponential variable, delta v, with parameter beta, okay? And for each node u, you place u in the cluster of the node that minimizes the shifted distance to u. So duv minus delta v. Right, that's that's the whole algorithm, um, and uh, for Wait, future. Again, sorry, I don't yeah. Understand. What's the? So for, where do you want me to start? So uh, what's, what's the definition of the cluster? Sorry. Well, so the cluster will just be all the guys. Um, all right, let's call this guy a cluster center. The cluster is all the guys <coughs> for whom this cluster center minimizes this expression. Is that the same as starting to walk out from? That you can think of yeah. You can think just about this. Going out with a head start based on that. Yeah, a head start or like a penalty. Uh, yeah, a head start, right? So just think of it, you can think about it in the following way. Just think that uh, node v starts growing a ball around it, around itself, at time <coughs> bless you at time negative delta v, right? And the first guy to a node, you know, consumes this node and adds it to his, to, your, to his cluster. Um, so those of you who have seen uh, uh, Shen's talk uh, last semester, have uh, seen proofs of these, uh, these properties and some others. This is, this is a really sleek algorithm and it's already found a bunch of applications, uh, despite how, uh, how recent it is. And um, what we're going to do now is uh, show you some more applications of this and some, <coughs> some other useful properties. So, yeah. yeah. So this isn't implied by, let's say, it's like linear sacks or our book or... Uh all the um, low diameter decomposition techniques? I'd, I'd be hard to tell you, uh, okay. mainly because I don't know. But um, I mean, this is, this is brand new, so I'm going to imagine that not, right? I mean, I, I, at the very least, I know that, this, uh, that these uh, dependencies are in some sense uh, optimal. You can't actually do better than, than that for these properties, sure. at least for something. Yes? So how do you calculate D between you and V? How do I calculate D between U and V? Yeah, yeah, so this is a great question, uh, which kind of leads to the next slide. Um, so let me, let me move on to the next slide. Okay, one question. Yes. Uh, what do you mean by if it's on the border of a partition? Like, uh, so I what I mean, let me go back to the slide. Um, so these guys are on the border of a partition in the sense that they neighbor another part, another cluster. So if I take a complete graph, wouldn't every node always be on the border? Uh, every node would all, mm, no. Right? Uh, so if I'm growing a ball around some node, um, yeah, uh, okay, fine. For a complete graph, there's like this issues of uh, tie breaking. Fine, but uh, let's, let's put that aside. Yeah. Nick, sorry. I was just gonna say that would be maybe. Uh, yeah. The diameter would be satisfied. <coughs> the diameter would be very small. Well, okay, there's nothing really happening. It's, if it's a connected graph, then yes, the diameter is very small. The, the issue is uh, the question of uh, gurus and it's not no, everyone on the border. And I'm just saying, if you put the entire all the nodes in the same like. Set, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll all just be in one set, right? So no one will actually be on the board then. Oh. Yeah. Okay, stupidly, yeah. There's no chance of actually a few guys left. Okay. Um, great. So let's, uh, let's maybe address Charlie's uh, question. So, I mean, what we defined earlier seemed like a very, very sequential algorithm. And, um, well, can we actually implement it in the radio broadcast network model? 
And uh, the answer is uh, yes, yes, we can. And uh, we can uh, run partition beta in time, point log n over beta, despite collisions and despite anything that might get in our way. Uh, so a message of hope, we can actually do this. Um, and now the question is, uh, how, do we, how do we use this? All right, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details of how we can do it. It's not particularly insightful. But, uh, let me just tell you why this is useful for us. All right, so back to our original thing. Uh, by property one of the miller prang su um, algorithm, if we take beta to be poly log n over d, and we run partition, we get a clustering of diameter, well, um, log n over, over uh, beta, which will be d over poly log n. Uh, trust me, I'm the, like, dividing through poly log, there's nothing really deep here. Um, so why is this useful? Well, the partitioning, uh, running beta was this, was this particular beta, uh, was, was beta being uh, poly log n over d. By the previous slide, we can do in poly log n over beta, which will be order of d rounds. All right, so this will be completely inconsequential as far as our overall running time. And for the schedule preprocessing, same thing. This takes order of the diameter of every cluster times poly log n rounds. Uh, but by, by our bound on the diameter, this, this too is going to be order of d rounds. Right. There's really nothing going on here. Just remember, uh, all, the, all the first steps of our algorithm cost nothing. So far, so good? So now let's talk about the time to transmit within or without outside of clusters. So let's consider a path P of length D from some node, some informed node S to some other node V. By, yes? Good question, maybe. Yes. So when we do this um, preprocessing, we do set this, uh, all these clusters you know, in parallel. Yeah. Um, but there is another interference connection to them. Uh, there is, and we, we kind of uh, get, um, we can surpass that with the extra polylog uh, factors. Right, so there, there too, I'm just running decay as, so as I was saying, uh, decay is a very good building block. In particular, it's a building block in, us, in our algorithm to kind of beat decay. decay. Um, yes, this, I'm, I'm, I'm glossing over a bunch of uh, issues, and I'll, we'll get back to that uh, sometime. Okay, the question was, what about interference between clusters? And yes, it's an issue, but let's ignore it for now. Uh, great. So let's look at the path. Now, now we're talking about the time to actually transmit the message. So uh, the d hop problem, we could just think about it as, you know, for every uh, node uh, in S and every node in its d hop neighborhood, there's at least one path of length d between those guys, right? That's, that's why they're in the d hop neighborhood, or d or less. Um, so by the second property, how many of the vertices on this path are going to be border vertices? Well, if these are the clusters, oh, there's no chance you guys can see this. Uh, Johan, can you see the clusters in the back? Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, all these, uh, the, we know that we have D beta uh, <coughs> border clusters, uh, border, uh, border nodes, sorry. Border nodes, okay, good. Um, and actually, we can ascribe the whole cost of uh, transmission to these border nodes. How? Well, for every node, uh, on its cluster border, we're going to pay the following. First of all, we're going to pay log squared n rounds for decay, right? Because I actually have to get from here to here, and from here to here, and from here to here, and you get it, right? Uh, so I'm going, to call, I'm going to pay log squared n rounds to enter V's cluster. I'm also going to pay something linear in what we denote by DCCV, which is the distance of V to its cluster center. And we're going to do this using our schedule. So remember that in the schedules, we could say, Within the subgraph, there's some node that you can't see right here, um, such that we're going to pay linear costs to get to, the, to it and from it. So that's what it's going to cost us within the clusters. <coughs> I'm not 100% sure that this, this uh, clicker animation was uh, clear enough. Um, Colin, can you see me over here? Can the, can the camera see me over here? It's more like what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so this is a cluster, right? We've paid whatever decay costs to cross this. And I'm going to have some, some node, which will be the cluster center. And what we're going to pay in here will be roughly proportional to 
if this is V, the distance of V to, its, to the cluster center. Right. And then we're going to pay the same thing to get to the last guy in here, and then we're going to pay for decay again. And this is all, all the, everything that's going to happen within a cluster. I mean, there's, there's some more communication going on inside here, but this is, this is all I'm actually analyzing. I'm just going to say, this is a, an upper bound on the time it takes for me to get from here to the last guy in the cluster on our path. Hopefully this drawing made it a little clearer. A few, a few nods, great. Any questions about this part? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So you have, you have D written twice, though, like, you're actually, because you say, like, how to pass from S to Oh, okay. yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's... All right, so this node is U. <laughs> all right, yes. great. Um, that makes sense, then, yeah. Yes, all right, so for every intermediate node, V prime, uh, we're, we're, cost, we're paying the, the time to actually <coughs> enter the cluster in log squared n rounds, and the time to traverse it, which will be roughly uh, the, the distance of the cluster center. Great. Uh, so what does this come, come out to? Uh, by property one, the distance to the cluster center is order of log n over beta. Why? Because the diameter is order of log n over beta, so the distance of any two nodes in the cluster is at most log n over beta, in particular, from any node to the cluster center. All right. Uh, Nick looks a little suspicious, and I think maybe already he sees why this is no good. So the expected time to cross P is going to be order of D beta times log N over beta plus log squared N. Ignore the fact that I'm grossly uh, misusing uh, expectations and uh, products uh, thereof. Um, and this is going to come out to order of D log N plus D beta log squared N. So if we take beta to be, let's say, at most 1 over log squared N, this is going to be uh, inconsequential, but this D log N thing is not quite what we wanted, right? We wanted to be d log n. Right, so if, if this uh, small uh, speck of uh, red color doesn't uh, make it clear enough, this is just not enough, <laughs> right? So this we're going to try and improve upon. And uh, the main reason why we get this d log n is because we have a slightly lax bound on the distance to the cluster center, right? So for the next uh, few minutes, I'm going to try and uh, convince you that uh, actually uh, the algorithm of Miller et al even has slightly better properties in this regard. Okay. Let's talk about our new useful property of partition. So consider some node V, and let Ni of V be the size of the ball of radius log n to the i around V. Okay. And let's uh, denote, okay, so this is n1 of V, this is just all the guys at distance up to log n from, uh, from V, uh, and n2 of V is all the guys at distance up to log squared n from V. All right, definition clear? Great. Um, and let's have uh, KIV denote roughly the, the ratio of two consecutive uh, ball sizes. Right, so in this, in this case, it's uh, <coughs> 9 over 7. Good. Uh, so why, why on earth would we be interested in this uh, quantity? Well, N. yep. Does NI include NI minus 1? Ni does include Ni minus 1, so that's, that's why I have this, this minus 1 term here. This is basically, uh, Kiv is this ring okay. over this ball. Okay. Um, so again, why are we interested in this quantity? Well, this is, uh, this is our main lemma, I think, uh, for this part. For any node v, if we run partition beta and take beta to be 1 over log n to the i, then the expected distance to the cluster center v will be order of log ki of v over beta. All right, um, well this is clearly no more than n. Right? Remember we're trying, to, we're trying to compete with a log n over beta bound given by npx. Yes? Is that expectation just over the randomness of the algorithm or like the... the this is just over the randomness of the algorithm. So this is for like any v. Oh yeah, oh yeah, sorry. For any, for any oh, sorry. yeah. Yeah, yeah. that. Great. Cool. Um, so as I was saying, uh, ki v is clearly at most n. Um, but how does it compare to the bound of uh, Miller, Parnham, and Su that we got, the log n over beta? Well, I mean, there's nothing that's stopping from Kiv being polynomial, right? Let's say like the first ball, or so let's say uh, the first ball has almost no nodes in it, and the second ball has a polynomial number of them. So log of something polynomial in n will still be log n, so that's, that's no good. Uh, but what we'll show in the next slide is that actually, um, if we pick i randomly, then the average log ki will be relatively small, okay? um, which will actually give us basically everything. So 
quick, quick uh, recap of the definitions. Uh, so the claim is the following. If we pick i randomly in the range 2 to log d over log log n, minus 5, ignore the constants, like this 2 is not really important. This is, this is not really important, just think of it as taking it in a range of size roughly log d over log log n. Uh, then the expectation of log ki of v is log n over log d times log log n, or at most that much. Right, so this, uh, this nasty looking expression is exactly the reason we have the same expression in our bound. So now I'm just going to show you exactly three lines of uh, calling it all math is maybe a bit much. So I'm going to throw these three lines of no <laughs> <laughs> of proof. Um, so if we look at the product of all of these ki's, well, it's upper bounded by just the product of all the ratios. And well, this, this easily telescope, so this is at most the, the last uh, ball uh, size over the first ball size. The last ball has at most n guys. The first guy at least has v, so it has at, most one, at least one. So this whole expression is at most n. Great, how do we relate that to the average of uh, log ki of v? Well, take out logs. So the sum of the log ki's is at most log n. And now just dividing through by this uh, t, or t minus uh, some constant yields the result. Minus one is probably one. Okay, this, this, there's really nothing, nothing too deep going on. It's like a kind of a three-liner. Um, yeah. So how are we going to use this? So I'll skip over this. Okay, good. So our claim was the following: uh, for any node v, if we run partition beta, was beta equals log n uh, to the i, also to the negative i, then the expected distance of the cluster center of v is order of log ki v over beta. And a uh, quick reminder from MPX, we know that for any node v, if 1v is an indicator variable for whether or not it's on the border, we know that the probability of 1v being 1 is order of beta. Okay? Uh, so what we'd hope, since we're, I mean, we're not really interested in the distance of the cost of center of every node, right? What are the nodes that we actually care about? Which nodes do we care about their distance of the cost of center? Yes? The border ones, right? So the ones for which 1v is actually 1. So we could hope that actually the expectation of 1v times this is at most well, that times this, which will be log ki of v. And uh, while you can't normally do that in this particular case, that's, that's actually true, right? You can't claim that the expectation of product is the product of the expectations. That's a lot of uh, nonsense. But uh, here, like in our particular proof, it actually works out. Um, so we find that the expectation of the, this indicator uh, v being on the border times its distance to the cluster center is order of log ki v. And by our previous observation, that means that for any node, if we run partition beta with beta equal log n to the negative i, and we pick <coughs> i randomly in this range, then the, expected, then the expectation of this uh, monstrosity is that monstrosity. All right. Um, and I claim that now we're basically done. So a quick recap of what we've seen so far. So we talked about decay. We talked about the fast schedules. We talked about the partitioning. <coughs> Let's put it all together. So a quick reminder of our algorithm. We start by partitioning the graph into connected low diameter clusters. Um, right, so that's this step. We then uh, pre-process uh, within these clusters to compute fast schedules. And then we transmit using these schedules uh, within the, uh, the parts and uh, use the K to cross between the parts. Right, and a little more precisely, uh, our partition will be used, will be run with uh, beta equal log to the <coughs> negative i n, i chosen in this range, just to guarantee that uh, the expected distance of the cluster centers will be small. And uh, with the, the pre-processing within each cluster will be done using the fast schedules of Gathali. Good. And finally, the transmission, uh, we use the fast schedules to transmit, to transmit to and from the cluster centers and not just any odd, odd, odd node. Good, um, and now we're basically done. So again, let's consider a path uh, P of length D from a node in S to some other node. Uh, the partitioning we've already shown takes order of D time. And the time to transmit can be ascribed to all the nodes, to all the border nodes, right, to these guys. And for them, what we're going to, what we're going to pay is the expectation of 1V times DCCV plus log squared N. I'm sorry, that's just a bunch of math for no good reason. Um, all of this ends up as D log N over log D times log log N. 
Uh, great. And overall, we get the same boundary just here. Um, so there's a few things I've glossed over. Um, let me start with one. So first of all, what we got in the previous slide was just a bound on the expected time for success. Um, that's, that's not what we really promised, right? We started off by talking about with high probability results. And uh, the solution is we just have to run this several times independently and we get the computation. Um, but now in this case you might be a little suspicious because all the nodes have to agree on the same, on these same randomly chosen values of beta. Which seems at, at the very least as hard as transmitting this one lousy message we were trying to transmit in the first place. Right? And uh, the solution to that is a significantly more involved solution where we have a two-tiered partitioning, one with uh, relatively coarse beta to just to transmit all these uh, values, and then we can use these in the battery. So I'm, I'm glossing over quite a bit of stuff here, but uh, uh, that's about it. Um, there's also the issue of uh, potential collisions between the clusters which uh, Boris brought up, and that too is, makes the analysis a little more involved, but uh, I think I'm gonna spare you all of that noise. Um, all right, so in conclusion. So using some pre-processing, yes? So there was one thing which you mentioned at the beginning of the talk, which is that you need to assume uh, the messages are short. Sure. Where did you use that? Oh, I didn't use it. I, I just didn't cite, I, I just didn't, you know, cheat and not have small uh, message sizes. So what's the cheat, sorry? So remember how we said that uh, the topology is unknown? So I can't, for example, somehow collect all the information on all the nodes in the graph mm -hmm. and just <clears throat> transmit the topology somehow. You, you, could imagine, you could imagine the following, right? Uh, all the nodes that are somewhat far away from, uh, from informed nodes, from nodes in S, somehow start talking to each other just to find out all the topology around. And you could maybe transmit that much information, which seems, seems a bit much, right? It's a lot of information just to transmit the login bit message later on. Okay. Um, any other questions? All right, so let's move on to, yes, go ahead. I mean, I guess it's the, with the summary slide, like what's the best lower bound you can get in this model where guys can wake up early? Hmm, D plus log square that. Okay. <laughs> right, so we don't know anything better than the, than the uh, I mean, the Kushilevitz and Mansur bound doesn't hold, but naturally the Alon et al bound does. All right, good. Uh, so in summary, uh, using pre-processing and uh, you know, sidestepping this uh, unnecessary wake-up uh, model assumption, uh, we, can, uh, we can beat previous uh, D-bound, uh, D-hop uh, protocols uh, running times and get uh, well, this uh, monstrosity. Uh, and we can contrast this with uh, roughly D log n plus poly log n round solutions that were known before. Uh, some other future directions, well, at the very least, we'd like to be able to shave off this log log n term and make it slightly more parsable, right? D log n over log d is a little easier to read. And uh, besides the fact that it's uh, easier to read, I think it's probably closer to the truth. Uh, and possibly more interesting, uh, more interestingly, it'd be nice to see if there are other uh, interesting properties and applications of partition beta. Uh, so since the ori its original uh, uh, publication, uh, this algorithm has found a bunch of other applications, for example, for hop sets and spanners and uh, parallel computing and um, there's at least one other paper in POTSI that's using the same thing. Uh, it'll be nice to see if there are other properties that might be a little more useful for other, uh, for other models and other problems. And with that, I can conclude. Let's go. How hopeless does it seem to get lower bound better than D? I mean, is this just C um, D? Well, I, I, I couldn't really tell you. I mean, I didn't spend a lot of time on uh, thinking about uh, low bounds for this problem. Uh, if I'd have to guess, I'd, I'd, if I had to guess, I'd say that D is the right answer. Just because for a lot of other models, if you remove a tiny bit of this assumption or a tiny bit of that assumption, you can actually do better. So for example, um, uh, Bernard has uh, several results. We, we mentioned the one, if we have collision detection, uh, then I didn't quite specify it in the right way, but you can get uh, D plus poly log n. Uh, if you know the topology, you can do d plus poly log n. There's, there's a bunch of other things. If you just relax a tiny bit of the assumptions, you can get d plus poly log n. And I think uh, relaxing this assumption about everyone not saying anything before getting a message is probably the same thing. Yeah. Um, so the, I guess the collision detection, if you have some collision detection that the same as having maybe multiple frequencies that you can broadcast on or something like this? Um, so, oh yeah, let's say, what happens if you have multiple, two frequencies you can broadcast on instead of one? 
Well, if you've got a lot of guys trans transmitting to you at the same time, I guess the two frequencies won't really help you much, right? Yeah, it's not really yeah. You can, if you have two, you can shave off something because your um, protocol can use, instead of, I guess, one over K, you can do like either this frequency or, or you can transmit on both frequencies or something like this and take advantage of that. Because there will be occlusion only on one frequency or the other. Yeah. Um, so again, the main issue here is whether or not the collision is due to a you know a truck full of, uh, of uh, nodes trying to transmit at the same time. If it's just two, then yes, you, you've got a better chance of finding out what's going on. <coughs> um, so for two I frequencies, can't you just multiply the time multiplex? Just you know, in odd time send frequency one. Yeah. Then um, so it's factor two. So it's effect. just a factor of two speed up, right? It's not, it's not quite clear you can do much better than that, right? I, I guess it mainly depends on whether or not uh, the hardness results require a collision of multiple nodes at the same time, right? If, if the hardness results just say, okay, this is due to two guys broadcasting at the same time, then yes, this like uh, duplex would make it um, significantly simpler, right? We'd be able to sidestep that. But I, I'm, I mean, I haven't looked at those uh, lower bounds enough, but um, if I have to guess, I'm gonna say that probably doesn't help. Any other questions? Right. Yes, I heard a speaker again.